In these notes, we're going to be learning about forensic anthropology. And by the end of these notes, you will be able to describe how bone is formed, distinguish between male and female skeletal remains, explain how bones contain a record of injuries and disease, describe how a person's approximate age can be determined, and discuss the role of mitochondrial DNA in bone identification. In the 1800s, scientists began studying skulls. This kind of laid the framework for today's knowledge. They had a lot of um, interesting thoughts that you could tell about a person's personality based on the bumps on their skull, all kinds of things like that. But they did discover some things we still use today. In 1932, the FBI opened the first crime lab. They saw that there was a need for analyzing skeletal remains, so the Smithsonian Institute stepped up and became its working partner in the identification of human remains. Kind of the first large-scale usage of anthropologic techniques was during World War II, where we identified a lot of soldiers based on their skeletal remains, because that's all that was left of them, unfortunately. So where does bone even come from? So bone originates from cells that are called osteoblasts. They migrate to the center of cartilage production and deposit minerals that turn the cartilage from something that's kind of rubbery into hard bone. Now throughout your life, your bones have to be maintained. Um, they do this by being broken down, deposited, replaced, and this is assuming you are healthy. People who aren't eating a balanced diet or people who have some medical issues, this doesn't happen which can cause them to have issues with their bones. The second type of bone cell is osteoclasts. And they do a lot of different tasks. One of them is remove cellular waste. They just essentially help keep bones healthy. Now your skeleton is not just a bunch of individual free floating bones. They are all connected. So bones are held together by cartilage, which wraps around the edge of bones and keeps them from scraping against one another. The reason your elbows and knees and shoulders and all of those move nice and smoothly is because there's cartilage on the end of that bone, which makes it slide neatly across each other. And there are injuries or old age can result in this cartilage being damaged or worn away. And there's a lot of medical research going into how we can help fix that. We also have ligaments that are bands that connect two or more bones together and tendons that connect muscle to bone. Both ligaments and tendons are subject to injury. Um, our surgical techniques to repair these injuries have gotten a lot better over time. So until about 30 years of age, your bone actually is increasing in size. All of that good food that you eat helps create strong, healthy bones. Now, after 30, you are not just destined to grow decrepit and die. Um, by things like exercise and a healthy diet, you can continue to keep your bones strong throughout the rest of your life. Now, what can bones tell us? So, an osteobiography tells much about a person through the study of their skeleton. There are a lot of things we can tell from a skeleton. One super simple example is that the bones of a right-handed person would be slightly larger than the bones of the left arm. So since you use that right arm all the time, you don't notice it, but the muscles on that arm are also slightly larger. Because the muscles are slightly larger, they've made the bone slightly larger. Now the average person might not notice this, but a trained forensic anthropologist would be able to tell if a person was right-handed or left-handed. That's just one small example of something they can do. So forensic scientists realize that bones contain a record of the physical life. This includes a lot of things. Um, we can tell about the sex, male or female, of someone, their approximate age, their approximate height. We can get an idea of their health status. What kind? Do they have large muscles? Do they have small muscles? Were they sick? Were they healthy? We can get a lot of information. So when it comes to determining the sex of a skeleton, there are two biological sexes, and there is male versus female. As far as the male skull is concerned, most male skulls have square eye orbits. As you know by now, your eye orbit is the hole in your skull where your eye is being held. Females, on the other hand, tend to have more rounded eye orbits. Now keep in mind, when I say square, I do not mean there's like sharp edges in there. I just mean it looks more square. Males also have a square mandible, that lower part of your jaw. 
while women will tend to have more of a V-shaped man mandible, which is what gives women often what is defined as a more feminine, delicate-looking face because it goes into a V instead of squaring off. This is why men are often described, on the other hand, as having strong chins. Male skeletons have a thick brow ridge, so right, right where your eyebrows are. Um, in many male skeletons, there's actually kind of a thicker bony growth right there. Meanwhile, females tend to have a much thinner and smaller brow ridge, so there still might be a little bump of bone there, but typically not near as much. Men have an occipital protuberance, which is a bump on the lower back of your skull, while females have no occipital protuberance. Males have a low sloping frontal bone, and you can see that right here, how it makes a very small angled triangle. Meanwhile, females tend to have a much higher and rounded frontal bone. One of the kind of difficult ones to tell on the ones we'll be using in class since they are fake is the surface of male skulls is often rougher and bumpier, typically because men have more muscle on their face. Thus, it roughs up the bone a little bit to give the muscle a good place to grasp on. Females, on the other hand, tend to have a much smoother skull because they tend to have less muscle in their face, meaning there is less gripping into the bone. Now keep in mind, this is not a you must have all of these characteristics to be determined as a male or a female kind of thing. They're kind of looking at sort of the average where you look at which do they have more of. So if you're sitting there feeling your own face, thinking that you have a mixture of these characteristics, that is normal and happens to everyone. Now the pelvis, on the other hand, is much more concrete when it comes to male versus female. The reason the difference is so strong is a purely biological one. Males only need their pelvis in order to stand upright, walk around, be a regular human. Females, on the other hand, need their pelvis to do all of those things, but also need their pelvis to be able to birth a little human baby. So all of the reasons that the female pelvis is different from the male pelvis all boil down to childbirth. So let's take a look. So males will have a subpubic angle, which is that front of your pelvis right there, of less than 90 degrees, so narrow. Meanwhile, females will have a 90 degree or greater subpubic angle because the baby has to come through there. Babies do not like small triangles. Their head would much prefer there be a larger triangle. Men tend to have more of a triangular pubis while women have more of a rectangular pubis, much better for baby to rest in. Men have a heart-shaped pelvic cavity, that center area right there, while females tend to have a much more oval-shaped pelvic cavity, once again, be better for baby to go through when childbirth happens. Men have a long, narrow, curved inward sacrum, so their tailbone tends to be longer and curves under, well, women tend to have a short, broad, and curved outward sacrum. This is because since the baby has to pass through the pelvic cavity, it also has to pass past the sacrum. If the sacrum is curved under, that increases the likelihood that the baby is going to break the tailbone during childbirth. Does this happen? Absolutely, yes it does. You can find plenty of cases of it online. But in general, women have a much shorter and curved outward one to biologically avoid that happening. So the differences in the pelvis are much more concrete, and um, men versus women tend to have almost all of the characteristics. There might be a little variation, but tend to have most of them. We can determine the approximate age of a skeleton by using something called cartilaginous lines. So... Uh, when you are born, you are born with 450 bones. However, during your life, the osteoblasts deposit calcium and other minerals into that cartilage that's keeping all of those kind of many bones apart from each other and fusing them into bigger and bigger bones over time, finally leaving you with 206 bones. 
So as the cartilage between them is replaced, what is called an epiphysis line becomes visible. And this is the area where you see essentially the cartilage being replaced by bone and eventually two bones fusing together. When the cartilage is fully replaced, there is no longer a line visible. It all looks like one solid bone. So based on the, how visible the epiphysis line is, we can get an approximate age. Some of the biggest um, things we use to determine age are the suture marks on the skull. When you are born, your skull is actually multiple different bones and over time becomes fused into one solid bone. So by about age 21 to 30, the lamboid suture, which as you already know is that one across the back side of your head, um, will have closed. So now it is going to be smooth back there. By age 30 to 32, the sagittal suture, the one that runs front to back across your head, will have closed. And by about age 48 to 50, the coronal suture, the one near the front of your head that runs side to side, um, will have closed. Now keep in mind, in almost all of you, all of these have semi-closed up, but you have this um, kind of zigzag pattern of where they are still working on closing up completely. As they close, that zigzag becomes much more smoother and much less visible. Height is another characteristic that we can determine based on skeletal remains. So just as age can be estimated by looking at the bones of an arm or leg, um, something you will be working with in lab, an estimate of height can also be made. So for an estimate of height, we need arm or leg bones. Often the approximate height of a person can be calculated from one of the long bones, even if just one is found. Your long bones are your humerus in your arm and your femur in your leg, although estimates with the ulna and radius or tibia, tibia and fibula can be used. Sex and race will need to be taken into consideration for this estimate. Different racial groups grow at different rates, and the different sexes grow at different rates. So you will have needed to make an estimate on racial group and sex before you can determine an approximate height. If you do not know this information, there are general ways you can get it, but it's going to be less accurate. You will be given formulas to calculate all of these, so you just need to be able to use a ruler in order to make a good um, recommendation. Now, I mentioned that race was something you needed to know in order to calculate height, so let's talk about this. Uh, the determination of race from skeletal remains is difficult. There's a lot of reasons it's difficult. Um, one of the reasons it's primarily becoming difficult is a lot of our racial groups have become blended over time as people have intermarried and had children with each other. This means that the physical differences between racial groups have become less and less. Additionally, not every individual has all of the characteristics of their racial group. Um, so that means it's not a 100% kind of thing. So there are some estimates that have to be made. But generally, the following characteristics vary by race. The shape of the eye socket varies by race between oval, circular, and square. The absence or presence of a nasal spine, which is this bony outgrowth inside your nose that you will be seeing in our lab. The nasal index. The nasal index is the ratio of the width of the nasal opening to the height of the nasal opening by 100. Different racial groups have different uh, nasal indexes. Proganthism, which is how far your kind of upper jaw angles outward. So uh, um, you will be looking at this in lab, but when your upper jaw projects far farther beyond your lower jaw or equal width, that can tell us something about the racial group of the individual. The overall width of the face is also a different racial group characteristic with different races having different common widths of faces. The last characteristic is the angulation of the jaw and face, where how strongly angled or how weakly angled the jaw and face are. 
Now, in our lab, you are going to be getting into what specific racial groups these different characteristics go in, but as far as your memorization purposes, you just need to know that these are characteristics we use to tell the races apart, not which race matches these characteristics. So facial reconstruction is also a big part of forensic anthropology. So a face is formed by the skull with the muscles and tissues on top of the skull. Many people think all skulls look very similar to each other, but they all have unique differences that can tell you something about the face that was once over top of it. So a face can be rebuilt from skeletal remains. So facial markers are positioned at critical locations of the skull and clay is contoured to follow the height of those markers. There are different locations in people's faces where the flesh tends to be thicker versus thinner, and they do this based on general populations. And also by looking at the markings on the bone to see if it looks like a thick muscle was there or not. Now there are still people who are doing um, facial reconstructions using clay and this artistic method. However, we are largely moving towards computer programs where you can scan the skull in and essentially add these markers and add virtual clay to put a face over top of them, which is saving a lot of time and money. These computer programs um, can also age missing persons and criminals. I know you've probably seen um, missing persons ads or something where they say like this person went missing when they were two years old, but here's what we think they look like at the age of nine. That it's a very similar computer software that is taking that face and aging it upwards. Now you may have spent this whole time wondering, why do we need to go through all of this? Can't we just use DNA to figure out who this skeleton belongs to? So bone actually contains very little nuclear DNA. Keep in mind your nuclear DNA is what is unique to you. However, it does contain mitochondrial DNA, which is something we have talked about before. You will remember that this is DNA that was inherited from only your mother. Everyone that is related to your mother through a maternal line has the same mDNA. So you have the same mDNA as your siblings, as your mom. Your mom has the same mDNA as her siblings, as her mother did, and so on. So long after nuclear DNA has been lost through tissue degeneration, because um, all of your fleshy bits are what contain nuclear DNA, the mitochondrial DNA can still be obtained from bone. The results can be compared with living relatives on the mother's side of family to identify skeletal remains. Hopefully families have kept pretty good track of who's missing and who's not, and they might be able to say that um, we haven't seen Jimmy in a couple of months, and... Uh, that's probably him, versus saying that anybody from their family could be missing. So this could be helpful or not, depending. So the last thing we want to talk about is a skeletal trauma analysis. Forensic anthropologists often determine if damage to the bones occurred before or after death. Because keep in mind, forensic anthropologists aren't often investigating um, someone who died of natural causes. A lot of times these are bodies that have been found buried in the woods and we don't know how they got there. So finding whether the damage on their bones occurred before death, relating to probably how they were killed, or after, such as animal activity on the body, is important to us. Definite distinctions exist between patterns on the bone made by weapons and patterns created by the environment after death. So a good forensic anthropologist is going to be able to tell the difference between a knife wound versus an animal eating at the bone. Sharp force trauma, blunt force trauma, gunshot wounds, and knife wounds all leave distinctive patterns, and we're even getting into the ability to be able to tell different knives from each other, different um, blunt force traumas, to tell more specifically what type of weapon was used. This is a really expanding area in looking at bone. All right, that's what I got for you. You're an expert forensic anthropologist now. Come to class with any questions you have.